In the second part of this lecture, we will look at the metabolic change during the fat and fasting state for each organ or tissue in more details. First of all, let's look at the adipose tissue. So on your left is the feasting state or the fat state, while on your right is the fasting state. So during the feasting state, adipocytes get lipid supply from two different sources. One is from chylomicrons, which is a lipoprotein produced by your gut that transports dietary fats. While a second source is VLDL or the very low density lipoproteins that transport fats from your liver. So upon arrival in the adipocytes, we need the enzyme lipoprotein lipase to break down these lipid molecules so that fatty acids can be released and subsequently be converted into triacylglycerol for storage purposes. Glucose, on the other hand, will enter through the insulin-dependent glucose transporter, which is your GLUT4 transporter. So here it undergoes glycolysis to give rise to acetylcoenzyme A. So that can be used for either ATP production or the synthesis of, of more fatty acid molecules. There is, however, another pathway known as the hexose monophosphate pathway which will give rise to a pentose sugar and NADPH, but it is less important. So over here, you have a net anabolic reaction, but the, during the fasting state, on the other hand, you have a net catabolic reaction. So with the help from the hormone-sensitive lipase, you break down triacylglycerol back into their respective building blocks, which are glycerol and fatty acids. So both of these building blocks will be transported into the bloodstream so that they can be used later for the generation of either energy or new glucose molecules by gluconeogenesis. And now try to answer this question. During the fat state, the presence of insulin, what? Well, the answer is A, activates. So during the fat state or the feasting state, do you get more insulin or less? Well, you get more insulin. And as a result, with more insulin, more chylomicrons and more VLDL are broken down into fatty acids by the enzymes, lipoprotein lipase. In other words, with more insulin, it actually it activates lipoprotein lipase. And now try this second question. You may pause the video for a while. Well, the answer is B, inhibiting hormone sensitive lipase. So this happens during the fasting state. So we know that during the fasting state, you get the increased production of hormone sensitive lipase or increased activity of the hormone sensitive lipase, breaking down triacylglycerol into its respective building blocks. So this happens during the fasting state when you have a very low insulin level. So a low insulin level actually is corresponding to an increased activity of the hormone sensitive lipase. In other words, insulin actually inhibits the activity of the hormone sensitive lipase. Okay, now we will look at the brain. And it is very simple because brain loves sugar. The brain will always require glucose as the primary source of energy. But under starvation, it can utilize other alternate sources such as ketone bodies. So here, glucose undergo what process to produce pyruvate? It is glycolysis, and then it undergoes which process to become the two carbon acetyl coenzyme A? It is your oxidative decarboxylation, and finally, the acetyl coenzyme A can enter the TCA cycle for more energy production. But what happens during hypoglycemia? Well, you still have glucose, but at a lower quantity of lower than 5 millimolar. So when that happens, your brain will utilize ketone bodies as the alternate fuel, which enter the metabolic pathway through acetylcoenzyme A, and eventually, you will still get energy production in your brain cells. Next, we will look at the muscle. During the fat state, insulin stimulates glucose uptake by the GLUT4 transporter which is insulin sensitive. So for this reason, glucose uptake by your muscle is an insulin dependent process. In other words, without insulin, there will be no glucose uptake by your muscle. 
and it is the same for adipose tissue because it has the same type of glucose transporter which is good for how about your liver is it insulin dependent well the answer is no because in your liver you have got another type of glucose transporter so what happens to the glucose in your muscle during the fat state well most of them are used for energy production while the remainder will be converted into glycogen for storage and you also get some protein synthesis in your muscle during the fat state because of the presence of insulin so for this reason insulin is also known as a hormone with anabolic effects which stimulates the synthesis of macromolecules such as protein and glycogen now what happens during the fasting state during the fasting state you have a very low insulin and therefore glut 4 transporter is not being activated so will there be any glucose uptake at all the answer is no so with that the muscle will then have to rely on the fatty acids as the main fuel molecules now at the same time muscle will also use the ketone bodies that's imported from the liver for energy production because both of these molecules can be converted into acetyl coenzyme A for energy production and because of the low insulin level your muscle will start to break down protein back into amino acids and there are many in the form of alanine and glutamine which can then be used in gluconeogenesis okay the main field of skeletal muscle is glucose but during starvation fatty acids are preferred but why well number one during starvation you have got a low insulin level and for that reason there will be little if no glucose uptake by your muscle so for that reason fatty acid appears to be a more reliable source because we can always produce more fatty acids by lipolysis however with the oxidation of the fatty acid that generates NADH and acetyl coenzyme A which are the substrates that can actually inhibit the enzyme pyruvate dehydrogenase now if you could remember this is the same enzyme that converts pyruvate into acetyl coenzyme A in other words when fatty acid oxidation is being switched on the conversion of pyruvate into acetyl coenzyme A will be switched off so for that reason even if you get any glucose production from your glycogen breakdown they will not be able to go through your normal energy pathway for ATP production but rather it has to go through lactic acid fermentation and later this lactic acid will be converted back into glucose in your liver by the Cori cycle so that is a long cycle for that reason glycogen breakdown during fasting or during starvation in your muscle is not preferred but rather fatty acid is the preferred molecule for energy production now on the other hand during starvation you also have got the breakdown of the breakdown of muscle protein into amino acids which are mainly alanine and glutamine because we can use their carbon skeleton again for energy production while the amino group will be disposed in the form of urea well how about the liver it is slightly more complicated during the feasting or the fat state your liver receives three major food molecules from your gut through the portal vein which are glucose amino acids and fatty acids which are transported by chylomicron so is the uptake of glucose by our liver insulin dependent well it's no as we mentioned just now because the uptake of glucose by the liver is fully dependent on the availability of glucose in your portal vein the more you have it in the portal vein the more glucose will be uptaken by your liver and glucose will then be converted into glycogen in your liver for storage purposes while any excess will be metabolized into acetyl coenzyme A which will then be converted into fatty acid and eventually triacylglycerol they will be transported by VLDL to your adipocyte for storage and we also have another pathway which is the hexose monophosphate pathway they will generate NADPH so we'll need that NADPH for fatty acid synthesis and of course we do receive amino acids which will then be used for protein synthesis such as enzymes albumin and so on but we will not store any amino acids in excess because they will be catabolized into carbon skeleton for energy production 
while the amino group will be removed as urea. Now, what happens during fasting? During fasting, first of all, you'll get a glycogen breakdown in a process known as glycogenolysis to maintain glucose level at higher than 5 millimolar. Then you also get the conversion of fatty acid into acetylcoenzyme A through beta oxidation. And acetylcoenzyme A will then be used to make the water soluble ketone bodies to feed your brain and muscle. And to produce more glucose, you also get the conversion of amino acids into oxaloacetate and eventually pyruvate and glucose in a process known as gluconeogenesis. So there are two pathways to maintain glucose level. One is by gluconeogenesis, while a second one is by glycogenolysis. Well, the answer is we get the energy from fatty acid oxidation, which generates ATP for gluconeogenesis and acetylcoenzyme A for ketone body production. And ketone body itself is a fuel molecule that can be used by your brain and muscle during long-term fasting. In other words, gluconeogenesis is depending on fatty acid oxidation. And sometimes, due to genetic mutations, gluconeogenesis can be compromised in some inborn areas of fatty acid oxidation. And in the case of type 1 diabetes, due to the lack of insulin, the cells are constantly starving. As a result, the body will switch on ketoacidosis for energy production and gluconeogenesis to maintain the blood sugar level. So what will happen to their fatty acid metabolism? Well, in the case of Taiwan diabetes, you will get an increased fatty acid oxidation. And this is reflected in the physique of type 1 diabetic patients because they are very skinny with a very low percentage of body fat. So these are the ketone bodies. You have acetoacetate, which is very unstable and breaks down into acetone. So acetone is very volatile. So if you smell a fruity odor from a diabetic patient, he or she is undergoing ketosis. And a third component of ketone bodies is 3-hydroxybutyrate. So ketone bodies normally present at low levels, but can reach very high levels in prolonged fasting. And they can be dangerous at higher level since ketone bodies are acidic. And now let's look at the glucose usage pattern during a progressive fasting. Assuming you had a 100 gram of glucose ingestion and start fasting, this is what you're going to observe during a prolonged fasting. In the first four hours or so, the ingested glucose will be your primary source of glucose molecules. And due to the boosted level of insulin, this glucose will be imported by both the muscle tissues and the adipose tissue and be converted into glycogen. And for that reason, in the next 16 hours or so, glycogen will be the major source of glucose. And that is also boosted by a high level of glucagon versus a low level of insulin when your blood sugar level is low. And around the 16 to 24 hour point, you will eventually run out of glycogen. But in fact, from around 4 to 8 hours, your body has switched on gluconeogenesis to maintain the blood sugar level. And eventually, on a prolonged fasting, you will see that the glucose usage is decreasing progressively as your body is trying to conserve those glucose molecules for the brain only. And my question is, where do you find the energy to top up the difference when you consume less glucose for energy production? Well, this energy is coming from the ketone bodies, which is the production from your fatty acid oxidation. Okay, these are the mechanisms we have to prevent hypoglycemia. First, our blood sugar level is regulated by the hormonal control such as insulin and glucagon and it is also controlled by the nervous system which is your hypothalamus that stimulates the secretion of cortisol, epinephrine and norepinephrine. So the minimum glucose level during fasting should be at least higher than 5 millimolar which is equivalent to 90 milligram per deciliter. 
lower than that value, the glucose core receptors in your pancreas and your hypothalamus will detect the change and respond with a reduced insulin production. And to get a boost of glucose level, you will need all these hormones. So first, your pituitary gland will secrete growth hormone and the ACTH hormone or the adrenal corticotropic hormone, which will then in turn stimulating the release of cortisol and epinephrine. So the function of cortisol is to stimulate gluconeogenesis and the function of epinephrine is to stimulate glycogenolysis. So in both cases, to increase glucose production. Now on the other hand, you also have the hormone norepinephrine under the control of your autonomic nervous system. And it has similar function as the epinephrine, which is again to stimulate glycogenolysis. And of course, your autonomic nervous system is going to stimulate the release of glucagon by the pancreas, specifically by the alpha cells. And the glucagon hormone has dual effect, which is to stimulate both glycogenolysis and gluconeogenesis. So collectively, all these hormones are known as the counter regulatory hormones against insulin because they have an opposite effect towards insulin. And these are the symptoms that will happen when you encounter hypoglycemia. And I'm not going to elaborate on this. We'll look at the action of cortisol in more details. In short, cortisol stimulates both the breakdown of proteins and triglycerides. Remember, its function is to boost gluconeogenesis. So it is from your glucogenic amino acids and from the glycerol, you will derive the carbon skeleton for glucose production. And on the other hand, cortisol along with other hormones like epinephrine and norepinephrine are known as the stress hormones because they are normally secreted in response to emergencies such as surgery, trauma, burns, sepsis, and so on, which is tend to cause hyperglycemia. But that is favorable as we need more energy in an emergency. Collectively, all these counter regulatory hormones stimulate lipolysis as it activates the hormone sensitive lipase. So, with that, you will get fatty acid production from triacylglycerol, while well, these fatty acids and glycerol can be used for glucose production and energy production. But on the other hand, insulin inhibits the hormone sensitive lipase and therefore insulin inhibits lipolysis. So what are the possible causes of hypoglycemia? Well, it can happen when a patient has injected too much insulin or it can happen when someone has too much insulin production or it can happen during fasting when one has genetic defect such as fatty acid oxidation or problem with their gluconeogenesis or even glycogenolysis. In other words, they cannot produce glucose molecules. Well, last but not least, hypoglycemia can also happen during alcohol intoxication as alcohol can inhibit gluconeogenesis. If you consume alcohol, your body will try to remove ethanol by having this two-step reaction which uses the alcohol dehydrogenase and all the dehydrogenase. And in both reactions, you will have the production of NADH. So what happens here is that when you have got a high NADH versus NAD ratio, that actually inhibits gluconeogenesis. And as a result, drinking alcohol without food will cause hypoglycemia as your body will not have the ability to switch on gluconeogenesis. And here is how NADH can inhibit gluconeogenesis. So you can see that both pyruvate and oxaloacetate are the precursors before we can make glucose in gluconeogenesis. But with a high NADH ratio, they will force pyruvate to be converted into lactic acid, while OAA into malate. So by having a high alcohol intake without food, you will have all these intermediates transformed into other molecules rather than being transformed into glucose molecule. In, in short, alcohol inhibits gluconeogenesis. To summarize, this is the hormonal response to a reduction in blood sugar level. First, you will get a reduction in your insulin level, followed by an increase in glucagon, epinephrine, and cortisol. And the combined effects of these hormones increases lipolysis, so that you get more glycerol, 
for gluconeogenesis and fatty acids for the production of energy through s 2 coenzyme A. And at the same time, these fatty acids can be broken down to produce more ketone bodies as well. Then you also get an increased glycogenolysis, which will then top up glucose molecules as well as an increased gluconeogenesis again to maintain your glucose level at more than 5 millimolar. Remember, glucose is very important for your brain function. And to derive even more carbon skeleton to make more glucose in gluconeogenesis, even proteins can be broken down into amino acids. So you don't have to really memorize everything, but as long as you understand the main concept, these are rather straightforward. With that, we have come to the end of this session. If you have any question, just send me an email. I'll try to reply your question or I can answer your question during our Q&A drop-in session.